Today, I'm speaking to Ben Goldhagen, the director of To the Zero Line, a film that came out this year. Of course, we will put a link to it. It's an incredibly immersive experience, uh, and it follows a number of people through the war in Ukraine, looking at the impact of their lives uh, and giving you a real impression of what it's like to both struggle on the home front, but also fight on the front line. We're going to talk about the motivations behind the film, the impact, and of course, its purpose. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome Ben to the channel. Well, thanks, uh, Jonathan. I'm glad to be here. Well, we we, we hit record, but we've had a, a, a really fascinating chat before we hit the record button, talking about the various motivations, both for your film and, of course, me behind the channel and so on. Um, I think we both have actually similar motivations, and that is a fear that we are actually living in very dark times and that if the evil of Russian aggression is not confronted, that something far, far worse may be awaiting us in the coming years. Could you tell me a little bit about your motivations for making the film and then we'll give the audience a bit of description of what the film contains as well? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it, it started basically with a knowledge of history. Uh, my brother is one of the uh, world experts on the study of genocide, and he's written a great deal about it. And uh, my father's a survivor of the Holocaust. And we, because we know what can happen historically when there is a genocidal campaign against the people, uh, both in a personal way, my family, my father's family, and then also in, uh, in a, a sociological way, in a, in a global way, uh, in the history of them, it was pretty obvious that this is what was happening, what's about to happen uh, in uh, the full-scale invasion, uh, which is a continuation from 100 years back of a Russian campaign. And uh, I, because of this awareness and because I have some ability when it comes to uh, filmmaking and I just made a film on survivors, of the Holocaust, um, I realized that this was uh, an opportunity for me to uh, raise my hand and to uh, make a film about the people who are in the situation and the rescuers um, who are trying to help and uh, help the people in the country uh, from becoming basically the victims of what we call eliminationism what is also known as genocide. And so that was my motivation behind it. And so then that was, that was what started. And then I had to figure out, how am I going to make a film? Then that's, uh, so this is your, is this your first film or attempt at making a film? This is my first feature. I've made uh, an, many shorts. I uh, wrote uh, a very odd film uh, in the past and I worked in TV, on TV shows, but this is my first feature film. And uh, it, it must be a daunting challenge, but what you've created is an absolutely unique experience, I would say. It's a very immersive film that holds uh, a mirror up to reality. In that way, it's quite sort of complex. It doesn't have the normal narrative tricks and techniques, um, but it has an extraordinary range of people and experiences in it. Um, how does the finished film reflect the sort of vision you had when you were planning it? Well, I, I started out by uh, wanting to create the experience for people of what it's like to be there. And in order to do that, um, in order to do that, I, it was necessary basically not to have voiceover. Uh, Frederick Wiseman, I have many influences as far as film goes. Frederick Wiseman is one of them who would just put the camera up and whatever happens in front of the camera is what you would see, and it would be the experience of being there. Uh, it, and uh, without going too much into like cinematic technique, I, I knew that I wanted the people of Ukraine or the people in the film to be intimate with the audience. And to do that, I had to uh, eliminate the concept of voiceover, description, anything else, so that you really felt, when you say immersive, yeah, that's, that, I really feel fantastic that you could say that because that was the intention from the start, that the, the, someone anywhere in the world could feel like they're actually there. 
And that's one of the problems, isn't it? This is one of the problems of propaganda. It's very effective at convincing you not to empathize with other people because somehow they are not like you. They don't have the same values and aspirations. They don't have the same language. It's You can put them out of your minds because they're not like you. And this situation has nothing akin to your life. It also seems to me that your film challenges that because it shows people who are quite clearly living in a sophisticated, affluent, uh, I mean, it's not hugely affluent, but living in a sophisticated European country, a sophisticated culture, there's a whole range of sort of emotions, there's a lot of cultural references. Was it your conscious intention to try and de-other the people of Ukraine? Yeah, because um, I'm somewhat of a I'm somewhat of a student of uh, of media, and I've worked in it all my life, and also of uh, of war uh, and how it's portrayed, and also of public uh, public opinion uh, because of my background. And uh, I knew that uh, I, I knew I, what I didn't want to happen was that this would be a war like about a place somewhere else that people would feel that it's so distant from them that it, it they couldn't relate to it. And that's sort of like the war in Afghanistan, even the Vietnam War for the United States. Um, you know, there, most wars are over there. And I wanted, and, and I wanted it to bring it home in a way for the UK audience, the US audience, the EU audience in particular, for people outside um, to be able to say, yeah, I'm just like them. And like any good war film, uh, and the great ones, um, it's really about much more than war, it's about the human condition. And so in order for, in, and so in order to uh, make that connection between someone in London or New York or uh, in, in uh, anywhere basically in, in the West, because it is really geared towards people in the West, um, they needed to feel that that the that the experiences of people in Ukraine, that the people in Ukraine and the experience of the people in Ukraine are pretty much the same as in any other other, other country in the West. So someone in Germany can identify with someone in France, or you know more or less. Let's not let's. I don't want to go too crazy about that. Or and and the UK and US. I mean, there's a commonality that we have. But you you Ukraine is Eastern Europe, and it seems like in it's in a place that's somewhere else far away. And so I wanted to show the way it is, which is very much like what you said. It's very much like the, uh, the, the cafes and the churches and the people and, the, and even the mindset to a large degree of someone in, in Paris or someone in, in London or someone in, in uh, New York City or Los Angeles. And of course... As we know, I mean, you've talked to many Ukrainians. I've interviewed many over the last two years and got to know a lot about uh, Ukraine, which I was relatively ignorant of before. But this is an interesting thing you point out here, and this is the aspiration of people. They not only aspire to be European, they feel European. It almost feel like it's their uh, sort of birthright to become part of Europe, or even further than that, they feel that they've always been part of Europe, but they've somehow been sort of, uh, you know, cut away from it. Russia was very effective at throwing this giant sort of uh, blanket over many countries uh, and, you know, creating this amnesia um, in the world about their cultures, their existence and their even their history uh, that predated uh, Russian occupation. And Ukraine has perhaps suffered that more than anywhere else. Did you get that strong sense of yeah, this desperation I, to become part of, you know, the European and global world? Well, the, for, for people in, in Ukraine, and I can really speak, when I say people in Ukraine, I, they, they're uh, on camera and behind the camera, there were hundreds of Ukrainians in this film, involved in this film. And I, I you know, and I spent a good part of a year um, living, living all over Ukraine with all kinds of people, uh, in all kinds, all different walks of life. And, uh, and I had sort of a de, de Tocquevillian uh, view, which was that uh, I was traveling and I had to study the country and understand what was going on now, um, as well as the history, 
in order to be able to make a film like this, because it's a very intimate film with the, both individuals and with the country itself. And so the, the, an, the answer to that is overwhelmingly, they, Ukraine sees, it's the people in Ukraine see themselves as right now choosing the West. And it's a conscious choice. They're willing to die for it. And they are dying for it, to be in the West. And the word that they use is freedom. Many people all the time say, one woman uh, said to me uh, on camera, she's not, it, that, this is part is not in the film. She said, look, I don't have children yet, but I want my children to be free. I want them to ha have freedom. And so they see, it's two things going on. One is that Russia wants to destroy their culture, destroy their language, kill them, rape them, destroy the next generation. That's the threat. But what got them, but up until this point, the, the desire has been, and they've been moving, not just moving to the, they're of a Western mind. And so it's, it's two things. It's, they don't want to lose their identity, but they also see the future being, uh, uh, being one of a civil society in the Western mold. And of course, Russia spews out lies. Some of those lies stick some of them more effective than others. Some are geared towards, you know, extreme left or extreme right or centrists. I mean, Russia is very good at creating this multi-layered falsehood. And of course, one of the really obvious ones, um, which actually has been perhaps less successful because most people see it for its absurdity. Not everyone. I mean, there are some people who unfortunately amplify it. And that is that Ukraine is full of Nazis. Um, that Ukraine is a Bandera worshipping nazi utopia and uh you know the west yeah. is is reviving uh you know nazi germany of the 1930s that is literally what the propagandists say and yet in your film you've got uh muslim volunteers you've got uh some sort of jewish israeli volunteers uh you've got quite a diverse set of people from outside the country who've come in to support this idea of freedom and liberation and you know when you visit ukraine I, I, I've i done now, you know, a couple of hundred interviews and only one person mentioned Bandera. And that was in a historical context, quite a balanced historical context. No one mentions him or refers back to him uh, unless it's in the concept of deep history. So how do you think your film, what's the impact of your film in helping to undermine some of these sort of absurd rhetoric of Russian propaganda? Well, you know, I wanted to show the country the way it is, you know, and um, and it's not just the country. I always have to say the people because it's really about the people. And every, every country is about it is composed of individuals. And uh, and so, I, you know, one obvious thing is everyone likes to point out that Zelensky is Jewish and they and so they and, and that's that. But uh, I'm Jewish. And so I can speak about my own experience. Um, and that I went everywhere. I I went everywhere. Every door was open, pretty pretty much to, to me. Uh, in the work that we did, and there were a great number of Jewish people, especially Israelis, at the beginning when the war was very hot, um, it, all over the country when it was unpredictable, who went into Ukraine and also supported the refugees coming out of the Ukraine. And because of this connection that uh, many Jewish people have to uh, this particular area, because this was the homeland of so many who uh, suffered, who survived the Holocaust and who died in the Holocaust. And there's a great respect for that in Ukraine uh, amongst many people. And, uh, and I really, I, I mean, I, I filmed a lot in churches and I said to, um, and, uh, and, there was nowhere. There was nowhere being Jewish was ever a problem at all for me. And that's uh, that can't be said of uh, every part of the world at this point in time. Um, and 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 Russia certainly tries to weaponize, doesn't it? Um, I would say historic tropes, whether they are anti-Semitic tropes. Um, they use a lot of tropes about Ukrainians, which unfortunately work pretty well in in Russia. But again, your film doesn't trade in the language of tropes it's the language of reality um how 
you know, it, it's there, it's out there. You're clearly working very hard to promote it. What do you think the impact is going to be? And, and how are you trying to get it in front of a wider audience? Well, there are a few things. One is that we, uh, it, it, it's streaming free on the internet. And that was a conscious decision uh, from the very start. The, the purpose of the film, it, the, the main purpose of the film right now is for people in the West, particularly, to come to be exposed to what's going on on two sides. Um, one is to understand the people and the genocidal peril that, 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 uh, that they face. And so, uh, it, so it's tiered, sort of like it's tiered the way that we're rolling it out. Um, the, most, uh, the most interested people right off are going to be what I call Ukraine fanatics. Those are the people who just can't get enough about what's going on in Ukraine, big supporters. And they, they become in a way the evangelists for what the film promotes um, by telling other people about it. And that's actually starting to work out. So there are people who are taking it to uh, people in Washington. I'm, I'm not interested in everybody in the world seeing this film per se, it would be nice, but there is a goal behind it. It's a project. And, um, and so, and, and in order to, to do that, the people who are most, are closest then become advocates of it. And that's actually what's happening. And so like on a place like Twitter, there are groups of people who are now taking up the film as a cause almost, as, uh, as, as something that they want to share with the people in their lives and the people in their groups. And so from there, I, from, so, that, so it, it's sort of, it's gonna take a little time to roll out, but the first, the first group is the people who are interested because they are. And then the next one that seems to be uh, responding are political people people who want to take it to people they know in Washington so that they, so that they see it. Um, and they become as, a, as, a, as a, a something to talk about. And the third one, uh, and, it, the, and then the third one, which is really, really wonderful, is that it's going to take off in Ukraine. Um, and I really can't talk about it yet, but um, the, uh, there, there's a, a somewhat influential uh, entity in Ukraine that's dubbing it into Ukrainian um, and for, for a showing across Ukraine, and which was really probably the biggest compliment I could get. Um, they contacted me immediately almost, and they said, we want to show this to everybody. Um, because it's a, it, it really shows the spirit of the country to the people. And while we were making the film, I constantly, because I'm not from Ukraine, I constantly was asking, did we get it right? Because we have so much Ukrainian culture in it. We have so much Ukrainian mentality in it. And I kept saying, like, it, 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 are we getting it right? Is this, like... Is this how it is? And so many, the people who work on it and many people in Ukraine say, this is Ukrainian film. Uh, even though it's, it's obviously, you know, it's obviously it, 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 in, the, in the oeuvre of Western cinema, but is of, it, it has, it, it shows the Ukrainian spirit from the standpoint of a Ukrainian. That's a great achievement because Ukrainians are extraordinarily sensitive to the nuances of their culture um and of course there's diversity isn't there from across the country in different areas different regions from those that are majority russian speaking to those that are you know if you're able to create something which reflects that diverse reality and then people can kind of embrace that that's a really difficult thing to achieve yeah well it 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 is and it isn't because I mean, if if you're you know if if you're a good traveler, and not just a tourist that's going to look at the you know who wants to have a photo in front of the Eiffel Tower, and you spend some time in a in 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 a place, and you live there for a while, you start to really understand sort of the rhythm of life, um, how people you know, how, what time does the street wake up, you know, what shops open, where people you know. What, what are people having for, for breakfast? 
and what do they think about things? And so if, if you're open-minded to in, in a culture and you really have your eyes open and you also are, uh, are with people who want to share that with you, and that's what happened to me, um, people wanted to open their lives to, to the film because they felt the film was a very important project um, that would help portray the country in a way that they wanted people to know about the country. And so they were, it, you know, it's, it's intimate in that way. And so it was actually, I think if you're empathic and you're aware of surroundings uh, and you have some artistic ability, um, you can, you can, you, you can, you can portray that to others. And it, it's incredibly beautifully shot. And when people you know, access the link, they'll see that. There are two aspects which I want to sort of go to next. One is this incredible intimacy. And I want to talk about one scene in particular. There's a woman whose husband has uh, died. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if he was hit by something or whether it was the shock of, of what was going on around, but she was clearly incredibly, um, I'd almost describe it as hysterical. You know, the things she was saying, incredibly intimate, incredibly um, affecting. Um. It must be difficult. I mean, you can't plan those kind of scenes. You must have to be in the right place at the right time. Is it difficult, though, to just carry on filming uh, through someone's pain to to capture that extraordinary moment? Uh, I'll tell you, um, I cried every day I, I worked. And also in editing, I cry at the same scene again and again. <laughs> it's like it, it just starts coming. Um, but when you're working, I mean, I think, first of all, I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for myself. Um, I, it, it, especially in some sort of horrific situation or some really dangerous, scary situation, just so focused on the job that, uh, that it's hard. It's, it, it's, it's a moment of detachment in order to be able to capture it, in order to be able to, to compose it. There's so much to think about. Um, that at that very moment, it's like, oh my God, you know, I hope I get it, you know, sort of thing. And then a lot of times afterward, and then afterward, look at it sometimes that night, it's like, oh my God, this is, this is just shocking, you know, sort of thing. It's like the doctors, the, like the physicians who work there, or, or even there's a, that you, you're there doing your job and it does take a lot out of you. Um, in order to do your job, you have to become slightly emotionally detached at that moment, at least for me. But it doesn't mean, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's just no time to, to react emotionally. It, it happens after. I mean, a good example is um, even uh, like there's, there's some, there's like tanks in it. We don't have a lot of combat in this film. It's about the people, but uh, along the front, there's just constant sound of artillery, and um, and then and but you know, you're talking to people, interviewing people, uh, filming whatever there is to film, and you stop hearing the the booming, you just stop hearing it. But on playback, it's like oh god, it's like uh, there's like all this artillery. It didn't stop, but I didn't hear it after you know it when you hear it day after day, it you really I mean it's you filter it out. So there is a filtering mechanism, I think, to be human that you have to have in these kinds of situations. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to, to exist moment to moment. I've, I've watched a lot of interviews with, with soldiers as well. And I think if they've got a job to do, they, they probably react in the same way. They, you know, unless there's an immediate danger, they'll filter out those uh, sort of background uh, sort of noises. You must have ended up with many, many t more times footage than has ended up in the film itself. You must have shot a huge amount of material. How did you then decide which bits to include and which not? That must have been quite a difficult, time-consuming and painful process. Yeah, we, we shot probably four or five times the amount of situations than we have in the film. I'm not even, I'm not even talking about feet like or you know uh, number of minutes i mean situations because we filmed in schools we filmed there's a lot of foot we we filmed at the front with the 24th brigade we filmed most of their units uh artillery uh drones uh tanks and so forth uh psychological unit none of that's in the film 
Um, and uh, the I, you have to decide what the film is going to be about, what the focus is going to be about, be about how you're going to tell it. And I wanted this film. We call it Part One. There, it, the, some of that footage that you that I just mentioned is in a subsequent film that we're calling Part Two, um, that's in post production now. And the um, and so I wanted this film to be about the the people and the peril. And so I thought we were going to have more combat in it. And I realized at two and a half hours, we didn't need any combat. Uh, we have very little combat in it. Um, we, have, we have all kinds of medical scenes that you can't even imagine how gory they are. Um, and, but we have just what you need in order to really understand what's going on with the people of the country, both at the front and also throughout the country in cities, villages, uh, towns, and the front and the relationship between those things. And that's what I wanted to show. I wanted to show the cohesion of the country to, and the culture of the country to people outside. And when doing the filming, what of your experiences for that extended period in Ukraine uh, really challenged your preconceptions, your expectations before you went out? What really made you think, oh my goodness, this is, this is really something? Um, every day is... <laughs> I think every day in a war zone, it's really something. I mean, it it and it it it's uh, it's really hard to uh, it's it it's really hard to comprehend. It was impossible for me to comprehend before I went, because, um, and if you think about it, most war as a Westerner, as someone from the United States, wars are always over there, and here's uh, here are these people who are living in the place that they're fighting for. And I, I realized it's in some ways it was like the American Revolution um, because they're fighting for independence from an aggressor. And uh, so, and it takes all kinds of forms for, all, for every person. And so the, one of the things that really surprised me from the start was that I, the original title of the film was To the Rescue. Uh, because my the, what I was thinking was that because no one came to, or very few people came to the rescue of the Jews during the Holocaust, I was interested in making a film about the people who were coming to the rescue of the people in Ukraine. And almost, from the very, very start, someone said to me, you know, it's not only people coming from the outside who are coming to the rescue of people in Ukraine, people on the inside are helping people in the inside. And that was probably the big moment for me that I realized this is a story about all of the, the basically it's sort of like a, a beehive where everyone is working together. And Yarko in the, in the beginning of the film says, everyone is a, a piece of the, everyone is a piece of the puzzle. It's a big puzzle and everybody has a part in it. That's what I didn't know going in is the, is the collaboration of the entire society of the entire culture and that's what I had to get, um, is how that all works together. And uh, both on an individu individual basis and also as a, as a, as a society. And I then everything is, went from there. I think this is one of the um, advantages, unfortunately, that Russian propaganda have, certainly, uh, I would say, on the extreme left and sometimes on the right as well. They can paint this as a war for resources, as a war for territory, um, they can say that, you know, Russians, Ukrainians are just the same people, really. This is all the military industrial complex stirring things up. There are various narratives that will dehumanize and take agency away from Ukraine. You've described a number of things there of why it's mobilized everyone from language to culture, identity, family, values. They're also defending a political vision as well, aren't they? Because all of this really kicked off after Maidan and the revolutions that preceded it. Ukrainians are also fighting for a political future, and that is one which is based on a concept of liberty as opposed to sort of tyranny and subjugation. How did you, what impression do you get of that? And how can this be communicated to people, let's say, in the US who perhaps don't quite understand uh, the revolutionary political nature of the struggle as well. 
Well, that it's it's like like I mentioned, the woman who said, "I don't have children, but I want my children to live in a free country," and that is that that is the feeling throughout uh, to the to the person, because that's why they're there and that's why they're fighting and that's why they're dying, and they're dying not for a piece of land in Crimea, because that would be it, if if that were it, then it would be ah. Oh, you know, take Crimea, we'll have, you know, we don't have to bleed so much, but they, they, they really don't want to live under subjugation. And the, and Poland is something that they look to and the Polish people understand this because they've created a very wonderful modern society for themselves. And uh, there's a strong identification that people in Ukraine have for the success of Poland that, um, that comes across and they see, they look to the East and they see, you know, Russia being uh, what it is, I, whatever, however you want to describe it. And they look to the West, their neighbor to the West and they see Poland, which has probably the best roads, you know, better roads in the United States and, you know, a free country and, you know, a free society and, and thriving. And they see themselves right there physically in the middle and they they know which direction they're going in, um, and it's to the it's to the person. I can say it's really to the person. Um, one of the things that I, I I just in making the film wanted to in order for people in the in order for people outside Ukraine to identify with it is to is that the entire cycle of life is in it. Uh, there's you know there's birth, there's a birth there's birth there's a wedding there's death, there's grieving. And I, and I wanted to show it so that I wanted to show those things in a way that could be, a, that anybody anywhere, any human being could say, that's just like me. And the reason why many people find the film emotional is because it reminds, you know, it reminds them of their own life. Like we, there's a cesarean section in the film and many, many women have said to me, Wow, I had a cesarean, and I didn't know it was really like that, you know. And that, and I, that was really interesting. It's the women who really pick up on the cesarean. Many of the guys say they can't look at it um, because we really go into it's very long scene. Because I wanted to make a point of many things in that in, in that sequence. Same with the wedding, or same with the you know there are a couple of uh, there there are a couple of uh, situations where where there are funerals or grieving. And these are universal. This is universal. This is part of the human experience. And to show, to uh, have the film, and it's really cinematic. This is not like a normal documentary by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think I'm willing to say. It's more like real cinema where you have an emotional experience with the with whatever it is that's that's going on in front of you or around you because of the sounds and it very easy you called it immersive to feel like you're there and so and so that that is all part of the 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 goal of the film is uh both to be there and to understand what it's like for them to be there and of course you don't you know i've done quite a lot of filming on on sort of smartphones and and, and normal sort of uh you know, cameras and so on, you must have had, first of all, the sort of planning that went into it and the, the equipment you had to sort of take. You must have had some some fairly, you know, substantial equipment to get that really sort of widescreen, immersive, really deep depth of field. The colours are incredibly intense. This immersive feel is, yes, it's the subject matter, but it's also the way you've captured it. So technically, you know, how much did you have to put into that and how much equipment did you have to lug around to uh, to get that uh, impression? That that was uh, that was another area where I uh, where I was learning what it was what it would be like to film in Ukraine during a war. At first, I the first rig that we went out with was really very simple. Um, it was one camera, one sound guy. Uh, so one camera guy, one sound guy, and me, because it was more like I had the I didn't know what we would be faced with. And so I was thinking more a lot along the lines of what would be a normal news gathering uh, rig. I never, I always wanted to shoot cinematically, but technically 
I thought all we can do is have three guys traveling around, you know, with one camera, one sound. And um, having, and then, so we filmed a bunch and I realized that to have that whole cinematic experience, it was insufficient to be, have only one camera for, edit, for, for reasons of editing and also for reasons of what we wanted to film. And so uh, we expanded to two cameras. Uh, so we were all at one point, so we were all shooting with two cameras, one sound rig, and, um, and then th so sort of kept that small. But then I realized, you know, what? we need more help with lights. So we added lights and then we added, you know, and, and the, the, the amount of equipment started to grow and the number of people started to grow um, because in order to, so this was really more like shooting a, uh, an independent feature film from a technical standpoint than a normal documentary. Um, because at some point, like in that chair sequence, we had five cameras. We had like five cameras in the, to film uh, the church service. Um, I don't know, there were probably about five sound rigs that we had rigged up. We had one for the choir, there was choir upstairs. We had two on the altar. We had one in the middle of the floor in order to create that experience. This is not a, a, how you normally make a documentary. And so, and then, so we ended up be having a van, filling up the van with gear and with lenses and so forth. And then we had basically everything we needed wherever we went. So we would go places not knowing what we would need necessarily, but we knew that we had enough, including a generator, because in Ukraine, normally in Ukraine, you could lose power at any time because of the war. And so we always needed to be able to have the option of lighting if that's what we wanted. Um, and so we were really, so this took a while. So if you watch the film, at, there's some, there's, there, there, you can tell, uh, you can tell some places where we had less equipment, where we had less coverage. And, uh, and then there are other places, we, we learned really fast uh, as far as how to, how to do it better. Um, but that, you know, that's a burden in itself to take everything, but it was much better to have the gear because we, I had an artistic vision and in order to be able to have that, to really have cinema, um, you need a certain amount of, you need a certain amount of gear, uh, considering we could not, uh, we, because we went everywhere. So in, in interiors, exteriors, uh, all kinds of situations. Um, that, so that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun learning, learning how to, that we could we could get away with it, and maybe the one of the most impactful scenes because of, I guess, the solemnity, the richness of the colours and the experience, and the fact you've got these multiple sort of angles and facets that you're cutting between is the church scene. And was it a conscious effort, a, a conscious intent here, <clears throat> to really have? You're not just showing sort of everyday life you're showing quite a lot of spiritual life as well a lot of depth to people's lives um first of all yeah was that an intentional thing or is that something that you realized would leave a gap in the film because you'd be leaving out a very real part of reality i mean there are not many films these days that actually show that uh, spiritual life uh, on camera yeah well you know most of what you see in news reports uh, ba is basically superficial. It's it's an event, but I was I'm always interested in what motivates people, what what the reason for why uh, the reason for why someone fights. Everybody has a different reason why they fight. Everybody has a different reason why they pray. Um, and so, what's always interesting to me, the spirituality part, is what it has to do with motivation and uh, who what. What makes a person who he or she is? And in the case of the church in, uh, in Ukraine, it's the, it's the uh, church, but in particular, the belief in Christ um, is very, very strong in the identity of many people in Ukraine. And, that's, and that comes across in the film because, it's, because it's, we're only recording what's there. You know, it, it's like, uh, we're, it's in the, in this sense, it's really cinema verite, you know, cinema truth. And so the church is, especially during the time of war, not for everybody. I mean, everybody's different. But I'll tell you, I was talking, the, one, one of the priests who's in the film, who's speaking, 
we were talking outside one day um, of the, you know, like uh, on the apron of, of that church. And a woman came up and said, can I, she was distraught. And she said, can I talk to you, uh, to the priest? And what happened, and it, her, uh, her son had just been captured by the Russians. And so, you know, he, he took one step away from our conversation and she said, can you pray for him? And I feel like crying now because it was, it was to her, that prayer was uh, what she could do to speak to God, her God for help. And it was probably at that moment that I saw the intense spirituality that many people rely on in order to get through the war. And I think it's incredibly important. There's two aspects that, that, that I want to sort of dig into there. One is that the Russian propaganda narrative is very much that Ukraine is banning religion, banning the Orthodox Church, etc., cetera, um, and is a, uh, you know, essentially they call it a heathen state. Um, if you speak Russian, like I do, and you can actually hear the propagandists in the original, um, I imagine it would be very much like being able to understand German and hear the toxic, vitriolic speeches of those propagandists with their genocidal rhetoric. It's exactly there. Um, they portray Ukraine as a kind of country led by Satan and Satanist ideas. I, I've heard that expressed a number of different times. What you're seeing on the ground here is a very, very different reality. However, the Russian version, unfortunately, is getting through to some people, some decision makers, and it's especially cutting through with certain people, a minority within the GOP, and with a, a certain element of uh, the evangelical community. They are actually believing this narrative that Ukraine somehow is is suppressing religion and politics. So how important is your film to inject itself into that debate with the sort of incredibly strong reality that you've been able to capture? Yeah, you know, one, one group, I mentioned that uh, the first group who is responding to, to the film are people who are what I call Ukraine fanatics, uh, but people, People have more than one interest in life, and many of the people who are interested in Ukraine or Ukraine fanatics are also interested in the church, their own church in the West. And so, some of those people have come, some people have come to me and said, "I I want my church," and I've also been asked to speak to Jewish groups, like to synagogue groups, um, because they they see that in in this film, and because uh, and and so, I think when you see the film and you see the church and you see also not just an organized re religion uh in 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 you know in the venue of of a prayer of a place of prayer but also the two women who are um who are uh making the camo nets and they make reference to to god um and it's just they're in their normal conversation about everything else they're talking about but you know it because it's really a belief it's not just when they're in church that they have this belief. And then, you know, and then it's very clear in the, um, the Christmas in Bakhmut sequence where the, that it's, you know, the, that it's, uh, it's more than Christmas to them. It's, it's a celebration of Christ. You know, they, they have this greeting, Christ is born. Um, and the way they cross themselves without, you know, it, and it's, it's, it's second nature in their in 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 the in the life of these people, and that when you see it, you realize you know what they this is the way it is, and that's an interesting aspect of the film. You mentioned Christmas in Bakhmut, but actually, watching the film end to end, I've watched it sort of I would say with full attention one time, but I've also had it kind of playing in the background while I'm doing work because it's got an extraordinary soundtrack. You've got an incredible choice of music that accompanies the scenes and really the way you flip the mood from one scene to another is incredibly effectively done through not just image, but also music, but also you have this sense of time passing because you have coverage of all of the seasons. Was that a sort of 
conscious part of your planning or did it just sort of happen that way that you realize you've you've actually captured a full you know a full set of seasons in a year no well the the way uh the way it works is the way it works for me is uh, and i'm not the first to say this is that you know a film cinema and i'll, I'll say cinema because this is not just a documentary this is a, an emotional experience i mean you're seeing like you're, you're you're experiencing something and that's within you that you're connecting with and um and it, it's very much like a musical composition uh which is there are you know there are different there there are different moods and and how this how music builds how it, how a symphony builds let's say um and what what the audience or what a viewer what a listener will the experience that they have over a period of time which they've given me which is to an you know over two hours of their life they've given me this time that they want to that they want to experience something so um so the uh the idea so my my responsibility is to make it interesting for them and to make it enjoyable for them in some way i mean and there are parts of this film that some people just find horrific and that so gory and awful that they can't watch it and that's fine because that's part of what you know the experience of war but and so as far as the seasons go yeah i realized that one way of and we we make you you realize that on your own because we don't say uh, you know here are the seasons but wanted to show really the country during a period of time because war happens during you know, during time. And in most films that have to do with war, um, or in some films that have to do with war, it, there isn't that sense of the calendar necessarily, unless like calendars flipping. So the way I did it was actually with the natural world, um, which was like you can, in, like there's apples on the tree um, behind the guys who are painting cars. And then there's that scene in the, the, of the village that goes from summer into to winter, and then winter. So yeah, it was very conscious decision. It made making cutting the film much harder, because there were things that we that might have been appropriate, uh, or in, from the storytelling standpoint, earlier in the film, but they were shot with snow. So I so it 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 made making the film much more difficult in order for the audience to have the experience of time passing, because that's what I wanted them to realize that time was passing. Yeah, and that that uh, that is a very effective uh, part of it. Um, and of course, to an extent, in wartime, uh, normal life and the rhythms of normal life are suspended or upturned. Um, and I think what you've captured in a very interesting way, and I'd love to hear your your impressions of that, is there are a lot of volunteers. There are foreign volunteers, but also you're at pains to show many Ukrainian volunteers, people who have, you know, totally changed their working life totally change what they do from morning till evening. Um, and a big chunk of their time now is in contributing to the war effort in whatever way they can, you know, whether it's baking pies, that wonderful scene of the, the woman sort of baking the pie to send to the front to her husband and his unit, um, or those making camo netting. What impression did that make on you? And how did you feel really that you wanted to capture that sense of a whole society coming together to assist? Yeah, well, when I started, I didn't know that all this was going on. I learned about all of this being there and being there for such a long period of time. And uh, it's, as I said, at first, I thought it was only people from the outside coming in to help. But then I realized right away because somebody told me and then I found out firsthand that the whole society, the whole culture, everybody is doing their thing to be support the war in one way or another. So the home front is very, very active with the uh, front line. And, uh, and how that happened was that uh, is basically one thing led to another because we developed the trust of people, which you need in, in the war situation. And so one person, like what, what happened was that we developed, we sent, uh, we, filmed the medicine being uh, delivered to the hospital in, uh, in Lviv. And somebody at the hospital said, oh, because they see that you're, you're credible, you're real. And, and 
one of the doctors there said, oh, you know what, I, we, we use the medicine we don't use here, we sort and we send that stuff to the front. So do you want to film that? So I said, sure, we'll film that. And then it happened to be in a church that, and, the, and the, they're making, the ladies next door in the church basement are making sandwiches. What are they doing? They're making sandwiches for the, for the Territorial Guard, which is in the film. And so one thing, one thing led to the next because uh, there's this interconnectivity of society there now. And because once you're trusted, you, once you're trusted within a group, because you have to be in a group in a sense, um, then the doors become wider and wider. And, oh yeah, I know a guy's doing cars. This, this happened all the time. It was, be, oh, this guy's doing cars and this guy's doing, this guy is, you know, we make Molotov cocktails, you know, so we had to film the Molotov cocktail part. And, uh, and, you know, and so, or this is, you know, program out of school and just, it became basically a, uh, and understanding one person to the next would tell the next, and we were there to uh, to record it. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to have the trust of people um, to uh, that they would open their doors to us. And this, I mean, to, to to sort of come to sort of the sort of concluding questions, I think this is a really important area perhaps to focus on. Finally, if this was simply a squabble about a piece of land between two governments, two armies, I wonder whether, you know, we'd have what you describe as the sort of uh, the fanatical pro-Ukrainians or the pro-Ukrainian bubble, as I call it. Um, if it was a case of just that sort of elites, you know, slugging it out, I'm not sure that would grab our attention. And your film certainly wouldn't grab our attention. It's the fact that it is society motivating to survive and protect things that it finds valuable, but also is one of the reasons we're also engaged with this, is this idea that Ukrainian civil society has shown us something which perhaps we have lost sight of in our own democracies, is that that we can't rely on governments alone to solve our problems. And what Ukrainians here are doing is seeing gaps, seeing areas where local national government are really not doing anything or, or not effective, and they're just saying, okay, well, I, I I can solve this myself. You know, no one's doing it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Is that something you felt was very precious and perhaps something that, you know, this is this is one of the reasons perhaps why we're so engaged with Ukraine as a subject. Yeah, I think that I think that um, the I think that what's going on there is really the what in a way it's very idealistic that in it's an, it's an idealistic concept that many people in the West have, which is people pulling together, that there's a society there that people from all different walks of life are united in purpose, which I think we I think we're missing that in uh, in 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 Western culture, uh, to some degree, because we're not faced with an existential threat. So it's like we can argue about things that are really much, much more, they're more minor in the grand scheme of life right you know from an existential standpoint but because it's because it's there and because they're willing to do it they're willing to bleed for it that they've that uh it's something that in a way the people who understand on outside what's going on there it's almost a romantic vision of it um that we can understand basically that these people are willing to do what we are not willing to do um, in the UK or the US or in France or in Germany, which is stand up and fight for something that for, for the common, you know, basically for your own family and also for your, your village, because you hear that in the, you hear that in the film and then for your country. And we have all three of those uh, said in the film explicitly, I'm fighting for my family, I'm fighting for my village and I'm fighting for my country. And, and of course, every Ukrainian is fighting to 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 win, uh, and they have a fairly common conception of of what victory means. It's getting their territories under their control so they can liberate the people who they see as hostages of the Russians. And if you hear what Russians do to people in in the occupied territories or who are captured, then then very much it's a you know a hostage type situation. Um, that mindset that 
singularity of vision and view and will is this one of the problems because we don't have that we don't share that or at least many of our decision makers don't seem to understand that um do you feel that we could be doing more or our mindset needs to change in order to back ukraine to win as opposed to what we seem to be doing at the moment which is backing them to survive yeah well i think it's twofold i think uh on the one hand I, and i think they're all different points of view but let's say you're you're really asking about the point of view that is not supporting them for victory in the way that they really feel that they are that they're going they're going in that direction it's the question of how, who is going to help them get there and the and, and so it, the answer to that is i think the people who are deficient in their thinking necessarily Although maybe they're interested, but they're not, they don't quite get the whole thing. The most important thing to realize is, is that this is a genocidal war and that losing for them means losing everything. It means death, rape, loss of a generation, children being kidnapped. And I think that that's missing in the, in the understanding of the people, of people who don't quite understand what this war is. It's not about a piece of land, Crimea, alone. It's about the survival of a group of people and a way of life and a heritage. And it's really, uh, it, and, and history will look back at this and determine whether the, we now help them survive or whether they're going to be, uh, or they're going to be uh, victims of yet another you know, genocidal war. And of course, subsequent events, uh, will maybe put that even starker contrast if other countries are subsequently invaded, if Russia is given impunity in the current war. Um, it's got a horrible echo of the 1930s, hasn't it? And missed opportunities. Well, I'll tell you what, one of the things that's very interesting um, as far as this film goes, um, on a per capita basis, um, we, I mean, we're getting strong viewership uh, in the United States, UK, um, and also within Ukraine. I mean, it's really surprising, not totally surprising, but how many people in Ukraine are watching it. But overrepresented are Finland, Poland, Sweden, uh, on a per capita basis. And in, in, in terms of what, what I know of the people who are viewing it, the responses I'm getting and so forth. So it's those countries uh, that you're talking about that are showing a greater interest in the film. We have great interest all around, but on a per capita basis, yeah, they're interested and they're responding. And they, uh, yeah, and many of them have been at the, uh, you know, the um, uh, the the painful end of of Russian imperialist uh, aggression in the past. So this uh, has a certain amount of existential threat to them as well. I would I would say. Um, the last question there, you, you've said that there's another volume on the way, uh, another film with uh, incredibly strong material that you're putting together. Um, do you have a timeline for when we'll be able to see that? Um, well, we're working on it. I don't. I want to come out with it this year because I want it to be, uh, and sooner rather than later, because it's, it's a different film altogether from this film, um, even though we shot a lot of it at the same time. Uh, this film is about people and the peril. Uh, the next one is about the combat. And the I, I don't want to go too much into it, but it's a different way of looking at combat and how the Ukrainians are doing it um, than I think uh, most people uh, most people have experienced. And then and not combat alone, but the reason why they're fighting, which is again the peril. Oh, well, we definitely look forward to that. I strongly recommend everyone who's watching this to check the film out. We will put links, of course, into the description of the video. Uh, it's a very haunting experience. If you've seen 20 Days in Mariupol or are about to see that, I strongly recommend you watch both films because it gives you a, an incredible multifaceted uh, view of the war. There is, of course, John Sweeney's film as well. Um, we'll pop links into that. There's say, three incredible films that you should watch um, and share to people who are not in the Ukrainian bubble because we're 
really you know keen to increase the understanding outside of those who are daily engaged with ukraine we want to re-engage those who've switched off we want to engage people to contact their representatives their politicians share the links to these movies and uh, get the understanding of what ukraine is fighting for um really out there to change the mindset of our leadership and make people understand that this really is not just an existential fight for ukraine it's one for us and our values as well. Ben, thank you so much for the incredible work you're doing and for sharing that experience with us uh, on the interview today. Well, thanks, Jonathan. And thanks for all the podcasts you do, because I've learned quite a bit from them as well. <laughs>